Good evening, everybody. I'm Mike Fournier on behalf of the language and literature department. I'd like to welcome you all to our second semester of the Bigger Boat Visiting Writers Series at Cape Cod Community College. We continue to hope that these monthly readings with working authors will provide refuge from the storm and space for everyone in our community to sail the creative seas. Thank you to Dean Kathy McCarran, co-organizers, Professor Tom Schaefer and Professor Rebecca Griffin, the Creative Writing Club, and everyone at Cape Cod Community College who contributed their support and their expertise. I understand that in this Zoom meeting, we have some live captioning. You can disable that on your computer if it's distracting to you. While we're waiting for everybody to filter in, before we start our readings tonight, I have a trivia question for you. The first two people to type the correct answer, the first two non-faculty members, I should say, <laughs> who uh, type the correct answer to the chat pod will win a copy of uh, Ron Austin's fantastic novel, Avery Colt is a Snake, a Thief, a Liar, which is out on Southeast Missouri State University Press right now. One prize per person. Type in your answers into the chat pod and you can type those directly to me instead of the group. Uh, our reader tonight is Ron Austin. He teaches at a school in Missouri. Please type in the name of this school to win a copy of his debut novel. All righty, while we're doing that, uh, earlier today, Ron Austin visited Professor Tom Schaefer's creative writing class, here to showcase some of the talent in our language and literature department is Professor Rebecca Griffin. Take it away, Rebecca. Thank you, Mike. So. I'm going to introduce Alexandria Zine, who is going to get us started today. Alexandria Zine is a four C's English major and a recent graduate from Sturgis Charter Public School and the International Baccalaureate Curriculum. She plans to pursue a master's degree and eventually become a journalist. Her book, which she's writing and revising, which she's been writing and revising for recent month, for recent throughout recent months, uh, is titled Concuture and other poems. She describes it as a web whose connections consist of my anguish and revelations from a brain injury and eating disorder, which coexisted two years after I sustained uh, head trauma in February of 2019. She hopes that her poems can console those who have dealt with similar issues. Alexandria brings an authentic intellectual passion to her creative work full of illusions, rich imagery, and a vocabulary that challenges even me. Her poetry is mature beyond her years. You will hear the influence of Sylvia Plath in her work. This is no coincidence. Alexandria is a devoted reader of both Plath, Sylvia Plath's poetry and critical writing more generally. But there is also something entirely unique, rich, and beautiful about Alexandria's approach to her work. I'm so glad that she's agreed to share it with us tonight. Alexandria, welcome to Bigger Boat. Take it away. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, Concuture, the eponymous um, Villanelle that I'm about to read is a preview of one of the many horrifying sensory changes that continues to revolve dishearteningly. Concuture, my mind's black gaps belie my pink sunrise. I cry as I rise and my blown head's lies. Once my eyes twelve crows fly, I start to die. All life bends and ends just to petrify me. Romulus and Remus can't survive. My mind's black gaps belie my pink sunrise. The hubris of Anubis hits my spine. With this madness, I have nowhere to hide. Once my eyes twelve crows fly, I start to die. I need more cues than you for the bright light of Thoth's box. My thoughts are wrought with snake bites. My mind's black gaps belie my pink sunrise. It never seems to stop. <laughs> what of my light? The wind kills it and paralyzes time. Once my eyes twelve crows fly, I start to die. The wind of this injury can kill me. I do not think I can mend my life's rhyme. My mind's black gaps belie my pink sunrise. Once my eyes twelve crows fly, I start to die. Um. The second piece is titled, um, My Salvage Sacramental Stock. So there are a few darker pieces within my collection about relinquishing my fractured reality during recovery. 
And this um, piece, like many of my pieces, retaliates against that. I didn't do it and no one should. My salvage sacramental stock, my pinkish pegasus, my brain. I can reap peace once I leave my land of doubt. I'll get out with my flattened and tarnished feathers and white dressings. Salt, salt. I must protect my thoughts. It's all I've ever wanted but it's harder in the wind's madness, my crippled lifespan. Beanstalk, cornstalk, all stalks matter. Just pull mine, my nerves, out of this glib ground. It isn't the same, it isn't the same. Life has really changed. Please turn me loose to my heaven. Um, and the last piece, Scarab. Um, the disorientation from the head injury and my year's worth of malnourishment had tormented my chances of recalling many things, vital things and sentiments. Nothing could be felt or spelt. All of it was fuzzy and indeterminate. It still is, though it is much better now. Scarab. Dreadnoughts, pink knots hurt nerves that I can't unbraid. They're as thick and black as the scarabs, the gaps that dash the Nile of thought. They are trampling on letters and out comes a word with an absence, a gap. How do I spell it again? Please help me. I am drunk, so ungainly from my dome throughout my limbs. If only I could eat. If only I could defeat the wind's waves of whistles. They blow me around, the waif-like wanderer. Keeping myself is hard. Everything is being lost. That's it. Thank you, Alexandria. Beautiful, beautiful work. Um, hopefully we'll see it in print sometime soon if you can um, get the book that you're working on published. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alexandria and Rebecca. A reminder that if you have an answer for the trivia question, please type that into the chat pod. And now for this evening's featured reader, Ron A. Austin's short stories have been placed in Boulevard, Pledius, Story Quarterly, Ninth Letter, Black Warrior Review, and other journals. Avery Colt is a snake, a thief, a liar, his first collection of Link stories has received several honors, including the 2017 Nielsen Prize for a first novel, a 2019 Forward Indies Gold Award, a 2020 Devil's Kitchen Reading Award, a 2020 Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize nomination, and a 2020 Hurston Wright Legacy Award nomination. Ron's work has been supported by grants from the Regional Arts Commission, including a 2016 Artist Fellowship. He, his wife Jenny, and son Elijah live in St. Louis. Please welcome Ron Austin. All right, so I'll jump in here. Um, so first I wanted to thank you all for coming out on this cold, cold day. Um, you guys could have been doing anything else, but you're spending the, your time here with us. So I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to thank Mike, Tom, Alexandria, uh, the Intro to Fiction class, the Creative Writing Club, and the whole events team for putting this on and making it shine and um, providing conversation. Uh, so hopefully I can read some interesting stuff. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to dive into uh, sort of a melody of different stories. I'm going to start off with the last story in Avery Colt. Um, this is a realism piece, and then from there, the story should get stranger. Uh, I want to say progressively stranger, but they're just going to get weird. Um, with this last story, it is the very last story in the collection. So just imagine that you read about a hundred and something really good pages, and you know you're on the edge of your seat, and you got to see how. And there's all this emotional catharsis and all that kind of stuff. Um, so we'll pretend, uh, but. Without further ado, we'll jump in here. So this one is Nobody Promised Milk and Honey. Before the corner store failed, Grandma used to sit out front and gut buckets of fresh catfish Granddad had caught that morning. Those catfish flopped over each other, fin slapping, mouths gasping, gill slicing open into long red slits. She pull a paring knife from her apron, set down newspaper and clean them right there on the curb. Sludge dripping guts glowed in the sun 
a clutch of bruised rubies. Once she had the fish frying inside, she'd stand in the doorway and hawk lunch specials. She'd be hollering, come and get it, come and get it. Fresh big lip catfish straight out the muddy Mississippi. Hang a tooth on that cornmeal crust. Hot sauce and onions ain't never had a better friend. I said, come on, y'all. Them pans is burning up. That grease is popping. Them catfish is jumping. Boy, is they jumping. Truth is, I wanted my first job to be at grandma and granddad's corner store so I could rattle open those iron gates at dawn, fire up that oil drum smoker, and squint as coal snap the chorus. I wanted to shave cloudy chunks of ice for snow cones, pickle hot peppers harvested from grandma's garden, roast chicken bones and gizzards for that good gravy. I wanted to sneak rings from the toy machine to young kids and hope aluminum hearts might ward off misfortune. I wanted to ride my bike and deliver platters of snoots, neck bones, and ham hocks. I wanted to holler lunch specials at day laborers, less lottery tickets, and haggle over dusty cans of sweet yams with mean, goat-bearded women who knew how to stretch a dollar further than Laffy Taffy. For real, I'd smooth wrinkles out of sweat-soaked dollars source from the heels of boots, the bottom of bras, ignore that damp funk, and praise working folks. At the end of each day, I doused the coals, rattled the iron gate closed, balanced the books by dust light. Grandma would peep over my shoulder while granddad scraped burnt bone out of the smoker. She laughed bitterly, pop one of those pathetic bills, and tell me, Avery, boy, it's raggedy, but it's still money, ain't it? All right, and so that is the intro of Nobody Promised Milk and Honey. So I'm gonna keep moving along here. Um, the current article I'm working on employs magical realism, and a lot of the concepts circle around a mysterious corporation called Catacombs Incorporated, and Catacombs Incorporated has installed itself in North St. Louis to offer some revitalization, but that revitalization comes at a cost, um, which we'll see in the starts of some of these stories. So this next one is <clears throat> Vedra swerves, jukes, death. Thanks to a brand new Catacombs Incorporated campaign, North St. Louis is going to bring loved ones back from the dead. An iteration of death itself had been contracted to manage the necropolis, collect flesh for enchanted commodities manufacturing, and facilitate resurrections. To make the campaign fair and sustainable, consumers needed to challenge and beat their region-specific version of death in a mortal duel. Clairvoyance on the company's marketing team had proposed the resurrection campaign, basing their strategic planning on consumer surveys that describe feelings of loss and suffocating futility. Furthermore, the clairvoyance figured the campaign would distract detractors of the company's metaphysical gentrification program. Now those gifted folks could compile celestial atlases out of common palms decode arcane scriptures and foresee tragedy in scattered chicken bones. But not a single one of them predicted the campaign would turn out to be a massive success or that grieving mothers would prove to be death's fiercest competitors. The mothers wanted to snatch death out his Adidas sneakers, fashion axes and shovels from his femurs, dig up and split caskets, Yank sons and daughters up from cool dirt, young bodies unharmed, robust and whole, chunky as sweet potatoes. Surviving Ken begged the mothers to quit all that scheme and nonsense and suggested they stick to knitting, gardening, gossiping, spoiling nephews and nieces, stirring soup, twisting braids, haggling at yard sales, managing sideline hustles, and musing in late afternoon sunlight. No need to be heroines. No need to risk defeat and transmogrification. Death could have been decent and just taken the souls of his new rivals, but he got off on turning germaphobes into dirty boots, conceited folks into stringy, wet clumps of magenta weave. 
A chorus of unheeded brothers, uncles, sisters, and cousins called the mothers pig-headed and sold them. Y'all need to quit chasing that pain before it turns around and bites you back. Ain't no use suffering over what can't be undone. But no, nobody knew how unnatural it felt to outlive a child. Nobody knew how elemental shame could pollute the bloodstream, wither veins, disintegrate hair into dust. Nobody knew how guilt reframed every embarrassing gurgle and burp out of their bodies as betrayal. The mothers couldn't give up that chance to kick death's tailbone, spit venom in his goddamn eye. Determined to win, the mothers recruited would-be champions from kitchens, beauty shops, supermarkets, church basements, and back porches. They revived hidden talents, met death at Fairground Park, fought for their children, and every so often, neighborhood gossip spread rumors of women who challenged and beat death so their sons and daughters could live to become astronauts, surgeons, soldiers, accountants, and deacons. So it wasn't out of the question for Phaedra Banks to whoop death in a game of one-on-one -on -one and resurrect her son, Jackson. Before retiring from the league, Phaedra's prowess as a collegiate basketball veteran had become mythical. Superstitious coaches claimed a shot of her sweat could transform bench warmers into starters. Chewing a strand of her hair could increase vertical leaps by two feet. And being 53 hardly diminished her fitness and talents. All those years of suicide sprints and squats had consolidated into massive inner resources. Once the bad news broke about Jackson, neighborhood folks expected Phaedra to hop into a clean pair of Air Max sneakers, snap on her goggles and crush death, 21 to zilch, but now, nah. Other women might have believed their sons and daughters shine bright enough to shame the sun, but Phaedra had to keep shit real. If resurrected, her boy would never become an astronaut, surgeon, soldier, accountant, or deacon. He'd only live on as a thorn in Phaedra's side, a boil on her backside, a blister between everybody's toes. Um, so that's that story. Let's imagine some really interesting things happen next, and it was all around a good read. Um, the next story, this is um, one of my most recently published story, came out in Boulevard. Um, I'll just jump right into this one. This one is called Brand New Plagues, uh, and I kind of like the word plague because it's not brand new, but brand new plagues, but I'll get in here. <clears throat> A mean hex mutated every sorry scrap of junk inside Three Kings pawn shop. Merchandise took on nasty animalistic aspects. Nothing could be salvaged, best believe me. I'm saying slimy water hoses slithered and shed snake skin. Microphones grew burly gorilla fur. Cordless power drills bucked warthog tusk. Tangled beef guts exploded from microwaves like spring loaded confetti. Leaf blowers whip thick elephant trunks. Braided gold chains flex tough bodybuilder veins. Often crackled from flim spitting bass speakers. Blood and snot splattered clean display cases. Beast stink head butted my nose. I peeped that repugnant mess and bugged out. I'd been a grunt slash bodyguard and more at Three Kings for forever. A ruined pawn shop would ruin me. I couldn't afford to change lanes and start over. I prayed for forgiveness and chain smoked three cigarettes back to back to back. But Effie, the high and mighty Miss Boss Lady, she didn't trip. Since Miss Boss Lady was the new owner of Three Kings, she had to prove herself competent. She couldn't flinch at high powered hood shit, fist fights, attempted robberies, or crooked ass cops. It looked like she wouldn't let supernatural assaults break her back either. Bargain bin black magic could be copped at any corner store in this time of signs and wonders. Canned sacrificial lamb, extra strength anti-atonement ointment, and everlasting sardine tins sat next to snacks and aspirin. Any chump could cast a brutal spell quicker than popping popcorn, 
smack enemies with festering boils. Well, this shit was brand new. Salty poltergeist swaggered inside big screen TVs. Designer purses pursed unrepentant lips. Brain matter clouded cubic zirconia. Antique revolver sneezed gunpowder. Disgruntled chainsaws growled threats. Shells rattled. And Effie didn't say boo. She didn't stumble. She didn't sweat out her finger way. She didn't drop her clipboard. She didn't bust one wrinkle in her frumpy armor plated blazer. She kept right on taking inventory with that tired look on her face, as if it was any other Saturday morning, as if beetle wing brooches weren't circling her head. I couldn't believe that front and ass phony baloney act. And all right, so imagine this one resolved in an interesting way. And then finally, um, <clears throat> I'm gonna read the story that started this new story cycle. Um, this story came out in 2016, and I think I'm starting to make some progress on the whole project. But um, this story is muscled clean out the dirt. Salesmen from Catacombs Incorporated couldn't solve every ghetto problem. They offered no solutions for gross poverty, quick death, or the weariness to congest heads and chests like a brutal cold. But they did offer one product that could restore blighted North St. Louis neighborhoods, Geb's Magic Red Bricks. Nobody asked how those salesmen could haul wooden carts heavy with hundreds of bricks, bulky arms straining under cheap suits, halos of sweat adorning bald heads. Nobody asked why only the finest women could buy a brick. Nobody asked why the bricks were irregular some of them bloated with muscle and green veins, some of them sporting coarse pubic hair, all of them pulsing with the faint heartbeat of a wounded animal. Nobody consulted apocryphal books of the Bible, divine explanations from prophetic dreams, scattered chicken bones. Nobody asked how the bricks could flex and twitch. So the finest women spent the whole summer commanding their husbands, brothers, uncles, sons, and grandsons to commandeer the remains of vacant lots and condemned houses, slice machetes and hatchets through brambles and boughs of honeysuckle, bang sledgehanders through crumbling walls and crack foundations, cart off rubble and junk, dump shovels in hard earth, and so Geb's magic red bricks where the land had been raided, salted, turned to soot. The most shrewd men wiped sweat from their chins and told the women, y'all done really lost your damn minds this time. You got us out here in this heat, moaning and groaning, humping and bumping. And for what? Some old hoodoo, abracadabra bullshit. Call us some sad, sorry bastards, but y'all don't listen no way. God bless and count yourselves lucky, we love you. And those same shrewd men shut the hell up and gawked when they felt the earthquake and saw brand new homes muscle clean out the dirt. And that's it. I think that's about time. So that's kind of a good overview of what I'm working on in the progression. Thanks for listening. All right. Thank you, Ron. Before we begin the question and answer portion, I want to thank everyone for coming once again and remind you that we have more excellent readers lined up for the rest of the semester. On Thursday, March 11th, a month from today, at 6.30 p.m., the Bigger Boat Visiting Writers Series welcomes Susanna Feltz. Susanna is the author of This Will Go Down on Your Permanent Record on Featherproof Press and is the co-founder of the Porch Writers Collective in Nashville, Tennessee. And of course, April is National Poetry Month, so we're putting together a roster of poets to read for you. Uh, we're going to start the question and answer session with Ron. If you have questions for Ron, please ask your questions in the chat pod, and I'll pass them along. So Ron, first question. Uh, this is the question we've been asking everybody uh, since we began the series. How has the pandemic affected your writing life? Um. Mainly just like the community, the sense of community is different. I probably, like a good example here, um, I don't know if your visiting writing series would be like in person, but if this was in person, I mean, that would be, I mean, this, like, it would be kind of exciting to go to a new place and plan some time around that. So definitely 
uh, not traveling is kind of a different aspect. But then at the same time, having the option of Zoom and all the events and readings that have been going on in this way, uh, that's been pretty exciting and I'm really appreciative of it. As far as, um, so the community is a little bit different, but at the same time, I think everybody, well, what's the word for it? It's kind of like a time of decompression. Everybody's kind of uh, in a little bit of stasis which isn't altogether a bad thing. I mean, it's not definitely not an ideal situation, but that part's not bad. And I find personally, as um, you know, I'm looking for people to work with and grow with, that it's kind of, it's kind of clarified, you know, some folks who are important and pivotal to my progress um, in my uh, work and who else I can have um, some influence on and I can support. So that's, that's been like a good unexpected effect of it. Um, as far as my actual writing output and stuff like that, I mean, I write at the speed of a glacier anyway. I mean, there's really no, no rush when it's ready, it's ready. Uh, so mainly it's the same, same kind of cycle, but I would say there are pros and cons to the sense of community. All right. Um, you've described your book as both a story collection and as a concept record, which we were talking about before things started, uh, were you a fan of writing first or were you a fan of music first? Uh, I'd say writing first for sure. Um, I think I became more interested, like more as, as like the concept album did. Um, I, let's say for instance, one of my favorite albums is Kid Cudi's Man on the Moon. And that's an interesting album because it's a concept album, it's, but it's sort of like, um, I would say it's a little bit of a looser concept album. Um, so from the standpoint of arrangement of your short story collection, which I would say arranging a short story collection mirrors arranging a poetry collection. Um, it's kind of an interesting exercise to take a concept album you enjoy and to figure out the different variations that are possible there or say like, um, if there's a song that's like a good song or you don't mind listening to it, but it doesn't really tighten around whatever the core of the album is, um, where does that song need to go? Could it be revised or would the album be stronger if it just lost that song altogether? Uh, so some, you know, so like uh, Kid Cudi's Man on the Moon, um, My Dark Twisted Fantasy, Triple uh, X by Danny Brown, even Bone Thugs and Harmony, their first couple of albums. Um, and then I like R&B albums like uh, Trap Soul. So all those kind of like albums, I kind of like, I just like investigating them to see how they fit together. Um, but yeah, yeah, definitely writing. And then I applied my musical taste to my writing. All right, we have a question here from Emma who says, lots of people write amazing stories that just unfortunately don't get published. What do you think, if anything, elevates a story from great to being capable of being published? You know, so I was thinking about this. Um, and I, years ago, I used to, the one thing I like to do just for the sake of it is always just say that writing is hard. Um, it just is. And once you really get deep into the flesh of it and you see the different kinds of techniques and possibilities, uh, it's, it's just as hard as anything else. But that's kind of what makes it exciting. And me personally, I like to set challenges for myself. And I always like to look at ways that I can take something good and make it even better, or I take something good and make it great. But years ago, I used to say like writing is hard, um, building a writing career is hard and publishing is hard. But I've thought about it recently and I've kind of changed my tune. So I still think that writing is hard. I think that building a writing career is hard, but I don't think publishing is hard. Um, the reason why I don't think publishing is hard is because there's a lot of opportunities to publish. There are so many different magazines and venues. Um, of course, you're self-publishing. And then what I'm saying is, is it kind of relates to what someone's goal might be in publication. Um, if your goal is in publication is to present the best work possible that you can possibly do, or if your goals are in publishing is to progress your career in a certain way, um, then publication can become difficult, but not really, because if you work on the quality of your work and elevating it, um, it, it you know, kind of, it kind of resolves itself. It'll get easier and easier to. So for one practical 
one practical bit of advice I can throw out is that one way to think about it is that sometimes when someone's writing a story, they imagine they have a lot of time to develop characters and scenes and they have time to kind of go on these digressions and stuff like that. So oftentimes um, I might see like a story that's 25 pages and there are 10 pages that are like decent or good, but they could, they could go. They don't need the 10 pages or what's the concept of that 10 pages could be compressed into two pages. So um, sometimes it's just a matter of revising, looking for the best parts of the story and catering to those parts and recycling everything else. Um, another way to look at it is if someone can take a story and every line does work, not every line needs to be like a standout line. It doesn't need to be a firework, but every line needs to build to something and it needs to aid the narrative momentum of the story itself. And that's something else that you see is that, um, you know, sometimes when the story is like right on the edge, um, maybe it's really good, but it's not quite to that point where if you send it out to a few places, someone will take it. Um, and of course, that's considering if you're sending to journals that only take 5% or 1% of uh, what's submitted. But with that being said, kind of going back and seeing like, do all these lines do work? Um, can I cut out some of these sections? Uh, the last little bit I'll say is that I'm a huge recycler. Uh, what I do when I'm drafting a story, as I'm making big changes, I'll copy and paste it into my scraps file. The longest thing I've ever written is my scraps file. Um, so I'm constantly taking bits and pieces and throwing them in there. And often what I'll do, if I, if I have like a germ of a story, I'll go back into my scraps file and I'll look for a scene or a metaphor or a bit of dialogue. And I'll say like, well, can I work it into this germ? And then I keep moving along in that way. Um, but well, I mean, those are just, all right, thank you. Uh, Deborah would like to know how you got started as a writer. Um, I started, uh, I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was 15. I, um, I always, always loved reading and I always liked writing. Um, but I would say that even though I had a pretty, I had pretty good curriculums, you read a lot of the same stuff in middle school and high school. So it wasn't until I took a philosophy class where I read Richard Wright and then also like a philosophy book by Viktor Frankl that I started to see something that mirrored more so my reality um, and my experiences, but also, especially with Black Boy by Richard Wright, I, the, the book and the experiences were familiar to me, but I couldn't understand why the book had such an effect on me. I was used to at that point being able to read or you know whatever our stories or you know and being able to figure out what the author was doing from here and there. This was one of the first times I remember just being completely stunned like this has a grip on me and I know that you know there's something at work here that I just don't understand. And so that guy and I kind of asked around and what was really good is the folks that I asked about um, pursuing a career in writing were like brutally honest, I mean, and not brutally, really, they're just honest. They're like, well, um, someone said like, well, for Richard Wright to write this book, and it might not have been Richard Wright, but they said something like, you know, some folks work on their books for 10 years. It takes five to 10 years of constant effort to produce one good book, you know, and that book might be 200 pages, you know, and then, um, you know, other folks are like, well, if you want to do this, it's publish or perish and so on and so forth. Um, and I just got in my head, I was like, well, if I start now, if I start practicing now and I focus on getting better from day to day, year to year, um, and just kind of objectively figuring out where I want to go career-wise, um, be, be able to make something of it over time. And so that's just what I did. Uh, so, I mean, and sometimes, I don't, I don't know, it feels kind of silly, like, I know everybody uh, comes to their career path at different points in their life, but I really did just make my mind up when I was 15, and that's just what I've been doing for the last uh, 20 some odd years. All right. Uh, Carrie is interested to know what you think the best and worst things about North St. Louis are. Uh, I mean, that's kind of hard to quantify because, uh, I mean, you can't. 
I, I mean, I can't really put like the qualifications of best and worst on like really any place in particular. And I don't know what would be useful to me. Um, with North St. Louis, mainly, I mean, that's where I grew up. Uh, I grew up on St. Louis Avenue. And with my latest story cycle, one thing that I'm concerned about, or well, rather, let me throw out this idea or this like story. Um, I went to college at St. Louis University. And in St. Louis, there is, um, there's a main street called Grand and there's North Grand and there's South Grand. And so North Grand is like where I grew up on the North side. And then South Grand is more um, towards South city. And then there's a street called Delmar that goes and cuts across Grand. And there's something called the Delmar Divide, which I didn't know about that growing up um, or you know the name and the history of it. But I mean, like I knew about it, but I didn't know about it. I didn't research it. But the Delmar Divide was like a redlining zone or a segregation uh, marker uh, where you know folks, you know black folks, just like, well, don't cross this line. So by the time that I was going to St. Louis University, I would often walk to campus. So I would get my stuff together. I would walk or I kept, I would catch the bus. And as I'm walking, moving towards St. Louis University, you have Midtown and there's like a sort of arts and culture district. You got the, uh, the St. Louis Symphony, you have the, uh, the Fox Theater, um, the SLU Chapel is really nice. Just kind of like a really beautiful, nice part of town. So I'd walk towards there, do my classes. And then just one day I was walking home and as walking home, I look back towards North St. Louis, uh, which is also called Old North St. Louis City. And I realized that there is a difference, that there is a difference between where I walked to and where I was walking, going home. So that kind of sparked my curiosity as to why is there this difference? Um, what, you know, is making this happen? And so I started doing research into different structures and so on and so forth, and um, just really kind of infuriating uh, hateful practices um, that spurred me on to just write about it, to try to figure it out myself and to try to process it through the act of writing. Um, with the magical realist stories, one thing that's really strange to me is that my neighborhood is really being eaten by blights. Um, so it's like when I go back home or I visit the neighborhood, um, you know, it's like a house where somebody used to live is now abandoned. You know, you come back maybe six months later or something like that and there's just, you know, it's just gone. There could be a sinkhole, like a literal sinkhole, or you just be flat and you're like, well, you know, where did this family go? And then this is happening to entire blocks. And this is also something that's manufactured um, that, you know, folks are making this happen just so they can make profits. Um, so I'm trying to understand what can be done there. And then there are lots of, there's lots of programming and interventions. And um, I'm at the point where I just think it would have to be a miracle. So a miracle to change things. So that's why I started writing these fantastic stories um, that kind of investigate and critique this concern. All right. Uh, we have a question from, from uh, Paul who says that you seem to have a rhythm to your writing or at least a rhythm to your reading of your writing. Uh, Paul is wondering if there's a conscious effort to put this on paper or if it's more subconscious. Uh, it's conscious because what I read more so than anything is poetry. Um, the reason being is that I really respect poetry in general. And I would say that, so your prose writing is composed of sentences and the place where the sentences have to be the best, where there's no room to hide is in a poem. And so a lot of the strategies and theories and techniques that go into poetry they're completely applicable to prose. Now, of course, there's a standpoint of if you're just writing in prose for the um, for the sensory effects. So, like as long as the reader can see, it's clear. Um, you know, they can get into the interior thoughts. That's fine. It doesn't necessarily have to have or employ those poetic techniques. But in recent years, I've just really been having fun doing that, and I feel like working on these lines really kind of charges uh, the rest of the story. So, it, I mean, it's both. I mean, I naturally, words and sounds um, and wordplay. 
And of course, in editing, you have to try to tighten your sentences as much as possible. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's a little bit of column A, column B. All right, and we have a question from Rebecca who says that she's interested in your work being semi-autobiographical. Uh, she wants to know what you think the relationship is between truth and fiction. Um, the semi-autobiographical part that I put on the back of the book, it was specifically because a few years ago, I had read Phaedra Banks' Dunks on Death at a, at a college visit. And of course, this is a story. I read the whole story, and then the story, um, Phaedra Banks really does play a game of basketball with death itself. And I got one question from the audience where someone was like, well, you know, did you know Phaedra? Like, is this somebody that you know? And I was thinking about it for a second, like, I mean, it's, it, she's playing basketball with death. Like, this is a fiction story. But of course, like, when you write fiction or when you do things like use the first person, but, um, folks, wonder how much of the material is coming from your, your experience. There's kind of that age old debate of write what you know versus write, write what you don't know, which I think the shortcut is just to be able to do both, consider both as valid and just, you know, decide what feels good for you at a particular point in time. So my relationship with fiction and truth, I'll kind of throw out an example from a story and then, well, I'll start with the broader sense can be used to get to an emotional or intellectual truth. It doesn't have to be like, a you know, physically happened. And even nonfiction writers, they make some considerations and take some liberties with the factual, actual truth, um, you know, which is just part of the craft. So with Avery Culp, um, you know, for instance, in the beginning, in the front flap, there's a, there's a news clipping about a corner market being robbed and then the owner fighting off the robbers. Uh, that was actually my grandparents. That was my grandfather. Um, you know, I had seen them actually get into fights at the corner market. I'd been there when robberies were attempted. Um, I'd seen them, you know, send some warning shots at people, so on and so forth. So that's something that I was familiar with. But let's say, for instance, in the first story, the problem in the story is that there's a possum in the attic. And I think that really great fiction stories or really great stories in general, you could say are made of like maybe three to five different stories kind of fused together. Um, so possums in the attic, what's my experience with possums? So when I was like about 20, I was living in the attic and I went on a long weekend with my girlfriend. And when I came back home uh, under my desk, I found some baby possums and it was, it's pretty disturbing because, you know, baby possums look pretty gross. And I was just like, man, now is there, where is the mother possum? What's going to happen here? And so that's where I encountered some possums. Um, my grandfather had passed away at that point, but my grandparents, like my grandparents, parents, and my sisters and me, we all lived in the same house. Uh, but my grandfather had passed away at that point. But when I was thinking about this story, oh, okay. So then a few years later, I was working at a restaurant. And uh, I was making small talk and one of the line cooks said they had a possum in their attic. And then someone said, well, what did you do? And he said, well, I shot him. And that was the end of the story. He's like, it's cheaper than an exterminator. And something clicked in my head where I thought, well, that's something my grandfather would do. So then that's where the story sort of took off. So I can buy most parts and then I added a few other things in. And that was all to try to get into this idea of self-reliance, you know, like self-reliance, trusting people, uh, masculinity, toxic masculinity. Um, so I like the flexibility in fiction that I can use to pursue these kinds of truths and experiences. All right, and uh, the last question is about uh, Avery Colt. Uh, throughout the book, there's, uh, there's a lot of, you sort of hinted at it uh, when you were talking about the newspaper clipping. Uh, there's a lot of found objects in your book. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of notes and scraps of paper in your book uh, that you use to tell your stories. I was wondering uh, where you got the idea to uh, incorporate stuff like that into your work. Um, so when I was studying for my MFA, um, I, I was really fortunate in that I was exposed to different literary uh, traditions. So kind of at its basis, the program was focused on realism. 
and sort of like American realism, um, which was good. And really it was good for me because I've always been naturally like a high concept writer. Um, but realism, everybody kind of needs it as a basis because you know you have to figure out how to use character setting, create narrative momentum, all that other kind of stuff. Um, and if you compare that with the high concept, then you can make interesting things happen. Uh, but along with that foundation in realism, um, there's also a postmodernist who came in and taught a class and it was really, it was a really great class. And I think everybody has like had some exposure to postmodernism, um, you know, even if it doesn't, even if you're not registering, like this is exactly what it is. So I became really interested in the techniques there. And a lot of postmodern techniques are kind of like high concept, um, but they pair well with realism. So the thing with Avery Colt is that it was a challenge to myself to see that if I could write my best attempt at um, American realism, just to see if I had like figured something out and if I had grown skill wise. But at the same time, I really, I really love postmodernism. It's a lot of fun to me. So I really snuck a whole lot of it in there, like just kind of like in some subterfuge. Um, and with the found objects, one of the kind of tenets of postmodernism is questioning reality itself. So that also kind of plays into the autobiographical element of the book. Uh, so there's a question of how much is real and how much is um, created, how much is fictional. So it, I wanted to create a certain sense of disorientation and that, you know, something like the news clipping on the front, that's real. And, but maybe you might not have read it as real. It might've just been part of the story. But then once you go deeper and you see these other little bits and pieces, you might question, is this real? Was this made specifically for this story? Um, but in a sense, I wanted to kind of disrupt reality, but also make it feel a little bit realer. Um, so that is that is my highfalutin answer. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. And thank you all for coming to the opening night of the second semester of the Bigger Boat Visiting Writer Series at Cape Cod Community College. Uh, Susanna Feltz will be here on Thursday, March 11th at 6.30. Then Paul Guest is going to be our poet on April 1st. Thank you for coming. Good night and smooth sailing.